Hey, good evening. Welcome to the midweek service. Good to see everybody here tonight. Glad everybody's here. Good to hear the, the sweet song of fellowship out there. It's always good. Hate interrupting that because that's always good. It's healthy for believers to do that. But we will get started tonight with our missionary spotlight. And this week it's coming to us all the way from Mexico City, Mexico. And we are going to hear from Mike and Mary Wallace, our missionary friends in Mexico City. So follow along with these pictures here as I read their letter. It says, Dear pastors, friends, and family, greetings in Jesus' name from Mexico City. Last week was a very busy week, as are most, and the future looks the same. Our teens went to a youth conference last week. This week, we have the extra activities planned with the orphans. Next week, our church plans to go to a music camp for a week. The week after we have a group from a supporting church in the U.S. coming to help with our week-long vacation Bible school. Mary is feeling a little better. We both thank you all for your prayers, texts, and emails. The heart study prescribed by the cardiologist confirmed what we su suspected already, which is an arrhythmia due to pollution, thin air, because of the high altitude and normal stress that comes from a lot of activity. Um, Mary sees a neurologist tomorrow about the numbness in her face. We had problems with arrhythmias before here, but it just got really bad this time. I just mentioned uh, talking about a big city, but at times we see things here that would seem to be more like rural Mexico, as was the case Tuesday. You can see up in that photo up there in the upper left-hand corner. It was a blessing that Mary felt well enough that day to go with the church sharing the gospel in the open-air street markets, and Mary snapped a picture of me too with the view of the crowded houses on a hillside. In the middle of the week, Pastor Alvaro and I went out to knock on doors. Alvaro had the opportunity to witness to Ramon, and after hearing the gospel, he got saved. So that's uh, the one on the left there. That's Pastor Alvaro with Ramon there. I got to talk to 24-year-old Edgar that day, who was a devout atheist. That's the one in the very middle uh, with uh, Pastor Wallace there. Uh, we spoke a long time, and the power of God's word and the Holy Spirit brought him from not believing in God at all, all the way to almost being saved. He was so close to putting his faith in Christ for salvation, but I wanted to be sure the decision would be sincere, so I didn't push him. That's very important. He said he works a lot, but he said he would like to visit our church in the coming weeks. Saturday, we were out as a church knocking on doors. It was rougher than normal area. We quickly noticed a couple sidewalk altars to Santa Muerte, the patron saint of death, worshipped by the cartel and others. That's that uh, red one right there. Uh, two doors down from uh, one altar, I met Juan Antonio after I knocked his door. As we began to talk, he admitted that he was involved with worshiping Santa Muerte, and we talked for a while, and as I began to witness to him, I sensed the gospel doing its work. Then Juan Antonio told me, I plan to visit your church soon, but what I need today is God's help, his forgiveness, and to be saved. How about that? He then trusted Christ as Savior. All right, praise the Lord. As mentioned earlier, we took our teens last week to a youth conference, and only nine of our teens ended up going, but they all had fun and were challenged spiritually. Uh, services were good yesterday, that's this past Sunday. A lady named Dolores got saved a couple months or so ago, and she has been coming fairly consistently and asked me yesterday for a Bible, which I gladly presented to her. Uh, that's her right there, standing in the room with her Bible. One man came yesterday for the first time. His name is Marcos, and he was invited by a church member named Roberto. Roberto had been witnessing to him, and yesterday Marcos trusted Christ as Savior after hearing the gospel. He was very happy afterwards, as you can see in the picture, after I presented him with the Bible. That's him on the right there. After the service, two young ladies from the family, Kohima, uh, that visited us last month, began helping our church's violinists at church via live uh, video in Google Meet. It was a real blessing and, and, we will, and will be a big help to our violinists and to our church. That's at the bottom there. Thanks for your time today. We are your servants for Jesus' sake, Mike and Mary Wallace. So let's go to the Lord in prayer. Uh, let's pray specifically for Edgar, uh, that he would come to church and that he would take the next step of trusting Christ as Savior. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you that we can pray with the Wallaces in regards to their ministry endeavors down there in Mexico City. We thank you that Mary was able to get to a doctor and 
Uh, Lord, learn the prognosis of our arrhythmias due to the pollution in the air and the high altitude and just uh, the stress in, in, from day-to-day -day life and ministry. So, Lord, would you just please help her, get her the uh, attention that she needs, and, Lord, help her to not overexert herself, but yet to take care of herself so she can remain faithful in serving you. And, Lord, just ha help uh, Pastor Wallace take care of her uh, through this time and to get her where she needs to be so she can get the help that she needs. Lord, we do pray uh, for Edgar. Uh, Lord, is, uh, he was an unbeliever, not even believing in the existence of you. But Lord, it seems like he's come to that point. But Lord, I just pray that there wouldn't be any more obstacles to him coming to know you as Lord and Savior. So Lord, would you please uh, just convict Edgar, even at this very moment, and help him to go through the doors of church there and come to know Christ as Savior. Lord, we do thank you for those that have trusted Christ for salvation and just the wonderful work that's being done down there in Mexico City. We thank you for the teens that were able to go to the uh, youth conference. I pray that they were encouraged and challenged to do what you would have them to do. And Lord, I thank you for the uh, many people that are coming faithfully, as well as the young ones that are helping with the violin, uh, just to enrich the music ministry there down in Mexico City. So Lord, would you just please have your hand upon them as they have many activities up and coming. Lord, give them the rest that they need, give them the energy, and be their strength as they continue serving you faithfully. And I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, just a couple of announcements for July events. One last event is this Sunday, Soul Winning Sunday. Uh, if you're able to stick around after the morning service, you're more than welcome to come. Uh, we'll be going to do some door knocking according to the maps. If you have a follow-up, you're more than welcome to do that as well. I'd encourage you, uh, if you do have a follow-up, that that would take priority. Uh, go and meet with somebody that you've already talked to or perhaps somebody that got saved previously. And uh, again, not a truancy call, but just an encouragement just to see how they're doing. Let them know that you haven't forgotten about them and uh, anything we can do to help. But mark your calendars for August the 18th for the church picnic. Looking forward to that day uh, as we get together here for an old-fashioned Sunday. Um, we do have some t-shirts made that have what you see on the paper plate there, the 20-year anniversary. Uh, so we'll be distributing those. I would like to see as many people as we can uh, wearing them on the anniversary Sunday, especially at the picnic. Uh, so we can let everybody know what's going on. So when they see everybody with a bunch of shirts on that say 20th, anniversary. Hey, what are you guys doing over here? Well, we're with Harvest Baptist Church. What a great opportunity to introduce people, not just to the church, but to Jesus Christ. Uh, there's a couple of years ago, actually, there's some people on our prayer list, even to this day, uh, where there are people witnessed to during our church picnic. So that was good, a good opportunity to do that, and a good opportunity to celebrate 20 years, 20 years as a church family, 2004 to 2024 here at Harvest Baptist Church. All right, uh, once again, uh, I will be taking the prayer requests verbally. Uh, let me get a pen here. I've got one um, until we can get some. I, I tried to print out the prayer request bulletins. They did not for some reason, but uh, I will get them out there as soon as possible. But with that, right now, who has the first prayer request? Yes, Cheryl. Uh, Ms. Carol, Trevor, yep. Okay, so that's tomorrow. All right. That's uh, Abby is delivering baby Trevor by C-section tomorrow. All right. Jordan, what you got, buddy? Uh, yeah. All right. Who else? Judy? All right. All right. Uriah? Thank you for raising Hey, man, that's a praise. Good job, buddy. Sam? Uh, my um, superintendent in my work. Okay. Okay. 
Uh, what's his name? Um, Paul Jackson. Paul Jackson. Okay. All right. Who else? Anybody else? Jordan, you got another one? Uh, I've heard the game. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yes, Dave. Oh, no. Okay. Okay. All right. Anybody else? All right. Yeah, one more, you, Ryan? Very good. Mm-hmm. Very good. Yeah, absolutely. Out of the mouth of babes, right? Yeah, Ryan. I am very grateful for all the prayers and everything. Uh, um, my next doctor's appointment is on August 4th, uh, and I'll have more to follow up after that. Okay. All right. Anybody else? Yes, Sam. Great director. Yes, yes, thank you. All right, uh, let's stand together as we sing our first song this evening. What we'll do is we'll sing a song. If any other prayer requests come up, uh, we'll take those down. But right now, uh, let me get my hymnal. <clears throat> let's uh, open to number 630. It's just like his great love, 630.
pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you. You are the one who rolls the clouds away. And Lord, no matter how dark and uh, destitute things may seem, you are always there to bear our burden. So Lord, help us to cast our care upon you because you care for us. And Lord, help us to just rest in you as you roll the clouds away. Help us now as we continue to come to you in prayer. And I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> Does anybody else have any more prayer requests? Yes. Yeah. Yes. All right. Yes, sir. Definitely need to do that. All right. Anybody else? Jordan? All right. Amen. Amen. That's true. Yep. Yeah, Uriah. Good deal. All right. Yeah. Keep praying that through. That's good. Anyone else? All right. Let's turn now to number 220. No one ever cared for me like Jesus. Number 220. Yep, 220. <clears throat> So dismiss Patch Club at this time. Men, join me in the office. Ladies, stay here and have a time of prayer.
All right, let's turn to our last one, number 269. Where could I go? 269. <clears throat> to the Lord. Where could I go? All right, let's open our Bibles. Today we're going to be in Genesis chapter 14 is where we're going to start. Genesis chapter number 14 as we continue our Bible study of types of Christ in the Old Testament. We'll be in Genesis chapter 14. <clears throat> and today we're going to look at Melchizedek, Melchizedek. Someone uh, very uh, little written about the actual account in Genesis chapter 14, but there's a lot uh, to be learned about Melchizedek from what we see in the rest of the scriptures and what God is doing <clears throat> uh, through his particular instance that we see him in Genesis chapter 14. So let's start. Genesis 14, go all the way down to verse 18. Genesis 14, verse 18. The Bible says, And Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought forth bread and wine, and he was the priest of the Most High God. And he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abram of the Most High God, possessor of heaven and earth. And blessed be the Most High God, which hath delivered thine enemies into thine hand. And he gave him tithes of all. And the king of Sodom said unto Abram, Give me the persons and take the goods to thyself. All right, let's take go to the Lord in prayer and we'll get started. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you uh, for the completeness of your word. Lord, I thank you that we can definitely see, especially in this account, uh, that every scripture, every verse has meaning. Just as you say, every jot, every tittle uh, is there intentionally for a purpose, to shine the light of the gospel of Jesus Christ. So Lord, help us. As we look at these studies, as we understand the truth of your word, but not just to see it as some interesting fact, but to realize just the power 
and the truth of your word and that it has meaning and impact upon our lives. So help us now, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So again, as we look at these Christ types in the Old Testament, it's, it's not just a, an interesting, it is interesting, but not just an interesting study to say, wow, that's pretty neat that you see that there. That's kind of a nice little fact. Uh, maybe I could answer a, a trivia question based on this kind of stuff. And it's so much more than that. It's so much more uh, than just the understanding about the word of God. Uh, as we talked about in the introduction to all of this, what this shows is the completeness of the word of God. It shows us the consistency of God and his word, and it shows the care in which God takes. And uh, even in many thousands of years ago, uh, when this took place, that God still had you and me on his heart, on his mind, and was orchestrating events to perfection uh, all the way until the end when he calls all of us home and uh, when he gives us the new heaven and the new earth. Everything is aligned perfectly. Everything uh, is consistent from very, the very beginning to the very end, and it just shows us the great care uh, that God takes over all the events, all the events in the world to watch over us and to point us to his son, Jesus Christ. And that's the same as we see here with Melchizedek. Let's take a look. Melchizedek as a type of Christ. And we see here, the first thing we see is the encounter with Abraham in Genesis chapter 14. That's what we learn about Melchizedek. What had happened is uh, Melchizedek, king of Salem and priest of the Most High God. Now remember, in the time of Genesis, uh, we don't have the Levitical law. We don't have even the tabernacle. Uh, we don't have anything uh, established in regards to that at this particular point. So to see him as a priest of the Most High God uh, shows the divine appointment in this encounter with him. It shows this was after the victory that uh, Abraham had had over the kings, and he had blessed him and received a tithe from him. A lot of times people will say, you know, uh, tithe is of the law, is of the law, is of the law. But we see here uh, that the tithe was offered uh, even before the law was even penned on Mount Sinai with Moses and before any of that was brought forth. We see the example set forth here through the encounter uh, with Melchizedek. Also, we see there's a prophecy regarding uh, Christ being a type of Melchizedek in Psalm 110. So hold your place in Genesis, go to Psalm 110, and we'll see. <clears throat> Psalm 110. All right. And this psalm is a prophecy of the Lord's ruling power. It's a prophecy of the uh, sovereignty of eventually our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Psalm 110, verse 1 says, The Lord said to my, unto my Lord, Sit thou at my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. The Lord shall send the rod of thy strength out of Zion. Rule thou in the midst of thine enemies. Thy people shall be willing in the day of thy power and the beauties of holiness. From the womb of the morning thou hast the dew of thy youth. The Lord hath sworn and will not repent that thou art a priest forever." After the order of Melchizedek, there it is. The Lord at thy right hand shall strike through kings in the day of his wrath. He shall judge among the heathen. He shall fill the places with dead bodies. He shall wound the heads over many countries. He shall drink of the brook in the way. Therefore shall he lift up the head. So we see that Psalm 110 prophesies about a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. And this psalm is actually quoted. We'll see it uh, when we go to the uh, book of Hebrews here in just a moment. We'll see it quoted there. And remember, that's what makes a something a type of Christ is reflected in the Old Testament. It is confirmed in the New Testament. Uh, we, we talked about that before. There are illustrations where individuals exhibit Christ-like behavior or Christ-like attributes. That'd be an illustration of Christ. But where it's revealed as a typology of Christ, we see that it is, it is settled and it is certified in the New Testament as well. And we'll see that with Melchizedek. And Jesus is the fulfillment of this prophecy, uh, establishing his priesthood as eternal and superior uh, to the Levitical priesthood. That's pretty much the uh, entire tone of the book of Hebrews uh, was explaining to the Hebrews that Christ is now our high priest. 
uh, Christ is the high priest, that they no more are following after that particular type of law. And there's so much more to the book of Hebrews than just that, but that's one of the underwriting points that the author, believed to be the Apostle Paul, is making with the book of Hebrews, that Christ is now our high priest. Uh, there is one, and, and he is the only one. There is no need for anything else other than trusting in Christ. So it makes him a type of Christ when we see that because of the encounter with Abram, seeing that, uh, again, uh, that he is a, a, both a priest and a king. And that's what brings us to the next point. What makes him a type of Christ? Why is this like that? And we see that he is a king and he is a priest. Uh, this is very uncommon uh, all throughout the scriptures, but also it's uncommon, especially uh, in the day and age in which this takes place. It was very unusual to find somebody to be both a priest and a king. Uh, a lot of times they didn't want those affairs intermingling one with another. Uh, but in this case, that is true. We see that he is a priest and he is a king. He, he uniquely held the dual roles of king and and priest, again, which was uncommon then. That wasn't something you saw, and it's something you definitely see when you see the encounter in Genesis 14. Secondly, we see here uh, that it's an eternal priesthood, all right? Turn to the book of Hebrews chapter 7. Hebrews chapter 7, you will see something interesting here when it comes to the priesthood of Melchizedek in the book of Hebrews chapter 7. <clears throat> right in the beginning. In chapter 6, verse 19, it says, Which hope we have is an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which entereth into that within the veil, whither the forerunner is for us entered, even Jesus, here it is, made an high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Okay? So there's the, there's the seal of approval. Melchizedek was a typified Christ in the Old Testament, verified there in the New Testament. But let's talk a bit about that as we see in chapter 7. For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, who met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him, to whom also Abraham gave a tenth part of all, first being by interpretation king of righteousness, and after that also king of Salem, which is king of peace. That's what Salem means. Verse number three, look at this. Without father, without mother, without descent, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like unto the Son of God, abideth a priest continually. Now consider how great this man was, unto whom even the patriarch Abraham gave the tenth of the spoils. And verily they that are of the sons of Levi, who receive the office of the priesthood, have a commandment to take tithes of the people according to the law, that is, of their brethren, though they came out of the loins of Abraham. But he whose descent is not counted from them received tithes of Abraham, and blessed him that had the promises. And without all contradiction, the less is blessed of the better." So again, there's a lot to unpack here in regards to the eternal priesthood of Melchizedek. Uh, one thing you will see, though, is no normally in Genesis, especially Genesis, the beginnings, uh, a lot of times when you see someone introduced, they'll talk about their lineage, their family, at least mention to whom they are the son of uh, in, in regards to that. We don't see that in regards to Melchizedek. And it's verified there. It says, without father, without mother, without descent, having neither beginning of days nor end. Nothing recorded in regards of that, uh, whether it means one one thing or another, but again, we see that there's the ambiguity there that we don't have with Christ, but the, the fact of the matter is painting that picture as Melchizedek as a type of Christ. Now, Christ is the beginning and the end. Uh, his father is our heavenly father, and we know his earthly mother was Mary, is by the divine birth, the virgin birth, which makes Christ deity, showing all of that. But at the same time, we see the comparison. Melchizedek's priesthood is described as eternal without beginning or end, unlike the Levitical priests who would have a beginning or end. The Levitical priests uh, were only to be able to be doing the work of the priesthood up until age 50. Then they had to transition into another role. Now, a lot of that has to do with uh, just the physical labor that had, was involved with, uh, you know, with all the sacrifices and just having to do all that. Also, it was about transitioning to the younger priests that were up and coming to make sure that they were trained in coming through the lineage. Regardless, after 50, they stopped that particular 
laborious type of the priesthood, and they would move into different roles, but sooner or later, uh, they would be done. They would no longer be a priest, and they would move on uh, either through death or just whatever it may be. Uh, but nonetheless, we don't see that with Melchizedek. Okay, uh, we see that, uh, what we do see uh, is that, that Jesus perfectly embodies both roles, reigning as king and serving as our high priest who mediates between God and man. It's pretty interesting stuff there as we see that. Uh, let's keep going. As we look at that, why is this important? Okay, we can look at these things and we'll ask that question. Okay, I get it. I get Melchizedek. Uh, was somebody that was listed in Genesis that had an account with Abraham, right? Abraham, who God had given the covenant, the blessing, saying, of you I'll make a, a you know, great nation that I promised to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, which eventually leads to the lineage of Jesus Christ, who is the Savior of all mankind. And we learn that through salvation uh, and, and because of, of, of that is the adoption into that, that's why we can sing Father Abraham has many sons because of what Christ did at the cross, Okay. We see all that, and we see that Melchizedek was a priest and king. We understand that Christ is our high priest. We understand that he is king of kings and lord of lords. But why is that important to me? Why, how does that help me in my Christian walk, right? Because, you know, a lot of times we look at that. That's good to know to understand the superiority of Christ and to understand that what God is doing in the, in the completeness of Scripture and that he was always pointing to his son Jesus from page one all the way till the end. But again, in my day-to-day -day life, how does this help? Well, we see that. Number one, we see the superiority of Christ's priesthood. Now, this helps, especially in a day and age in which we live where people are questioning things, especially things of faith. You see, Melchizedek's priesthood points to the superiority of Christ over the Levitical system. That would be very, uh, very convincing to the Hebrews at that time, but it's still true for us as well. It underscores the completeness of Christ's sacrifice and his ongoing intercession, okay? It, it helps us really understand the truth of the matter as we saw in Psalm 110 where Christ sits at the right hand of God. And as he sits at the right hand of God, he is interceding for us as the eternal high priest. And we have to understand that when we're praying, and we're praying unto the Lord, and we're, we're praying unto Jesus, that Jesus is standing on our behalf in regards to salvation. And we're praying directly to Jesus, but he's saying, Heavenly Father, I, I stand here on behalf of Jeremy, and because of the, the, the scars of my hands, because of my thorn crown brow, because of the price I paid at Calvary, and God hears it. Okay, and God understands that. He, you know, we have been cleansed from that. He is interceding for us. And we see his priesthood as the ultimate intercessor. But furthermore, again, we see the fulfillment of prophecy. This goes with the consistency of Scripture. Prophecy fulfillment is of the utmost importance because it solidifies that God is going to do what he said he's going to do because he has done what he says he would do. This brings us to Hebrew. We don't have to turn there, but Hebrews chapter eleven, faith is the substance, right, of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. This gives us that substance. This is just one microcosm of a tremendously fulfilled prophecy that gives us that substance to say, you know what? God promised a high priest after the order of Melchizedek, and He fulfilled that promise through His Son Jesus Christ. And as his son, Jesus Christ, sitting at the right hand of the Father, intercedes for me, stands on my behalf, represents me at the throne of our Heavenly Father. And that should give us hope. And that should help us in our faith. It's based on the power of an indestructible life, not on ancestry, not on law, not on history, not on tradition. It's based on, thus saith the Lord the fulfillment of that prophecy. Again, affirming the reliability and the consistency of God's word. Okay, And it also assures us that God's promises are trustworthy and that Jesus is indeed the long-awaited Messiah. It just proves that. Prove to me that Jesus is God. Here's some evidence for you. Okay, Now, for us sitting here, we think, well, yes, I know that Jesus is God. I know that he's the Messiah. I know he's the King of Kings. I know he's our high priest. I know all of that. But this kind of gives us some substance behind it. Because there may be, you know, when it comes to our witness, when it comes to sharing our faith, well, yeah, you say that, but why is that true? Well, that's just what we say in church. Well, it's just the way it always is. No, we need to be able to provide some evidence as given through scriptures 
of the superiority and the sufficiency of Jesus Christ. Because even the Muslims will say, well, Jesus was a good man. Jesus was a prophet. Some Muslims will tell you, I believe about Jesus. That is not the same as believing in Jesus, okay? And it, it, there is no common ground there. Okay, because Jesus is the Messiah. Jesus is God in the flesh. Jesus is our Lord and Savior, not just some prophet that lived on earth and did some kind things. No, he is the Savior of the world. And this helps to that, to say, you know, Jesus is the high priest after the order of Melchizedek because God introduced Melchizedek to Abraham uh, after the battle. And uh, Abraham, you know, gave tithes unto him, showing that he was the priest and king. Psalm 110 gives the prophecy that there will be another that is after the order of Melchizedek, and it is fulfilled in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Again, this should be solidifying your faith, okay? Again, not just to win arguments. He okay, should be giving just nutrition to your spiritual bones is what this is, okay? So that's why it's important. It, it just shows the superiority of Christ, and it's, it, it's solidified through the fulfillment of prophecy. So what does that mean for the believer today? It means this. It, it gives us assurance of our salvation. Uh, you know, again, I, I understand. By grace are you saved through faith. And anybody says, yes, I know I'm born again. I know I'm a believer. I remember the day that I understood that I was a sinner. I remember the day that I understood that I was in need of salvation. And I went forward or I went to my room or I sat in my car or wherever it was uh, that you said, I, I remember calling upon Jesus Christ as my Savior and I know that I am saved. And that is all the assurance I need. Understood. I get that. But this really, really helps us in, in regards to just really, really solidifying that. I do deal with Christians that wonder about their salvation. They may have gotten away from God for a time. They may be turning away from the Lord. They may be on a different path, or maybe they're just struggling in life. And, and sometimes they just wonder, well, am I really saved? Am I really saved, right? Because some people will deceive them, and they'll say, well, if you're really saved, then you'll be, and they'll fill in these lists of activities that say that these works are helping us hold on to our salvation. That's not true. The assurance of our salvation comes from Christ's eternal priesthood. It gives us confidence in our salvation. Unlike the Levitical priest who had to offer sacrifices to show the picture of Jesus Christ, Christ's one sacrifice is sufficient for all time. One and done. Okay, one and done. That's one thing you'll run into as you go out on soul winning uh, uh, Sunday. You'll go out there and you'll hear people say either one thing. They'll say one or two things. They'll say... Oh, yeah, you'll, you'll say, have you ever prayed to receive Christ as your Savior? Oh, I pray all the time. I pray every day. Well, that's not the question I'm asking. Uh, have you ever prayed to ask Christ to save you? Oh, yeah, I ask Christ, Jesus to save me all the time. One day I was in traffic and, and a deer jumped out and I said, Jesus, save me. And the deer went the other way. Yeah, I pray for Jesus to save me all the time, right? That's not what we're talking about, okay? Uh, so, again, it helps us understand uh, in regards to that that it's the sacrifice of Christ dying for your sin and, and asking for salvation from the penalty of your sin and understanding those types of things, that it was one and done, once and for all, uh, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, right? So it assures us that God's promises are trustworthy, but also uh, it helps us understand that we can approach God with boldness, Okay, remember, boldness is not being haughty. Boldness is, is coming with the substance of thus saith the Lord. Okay? Uh, it reminds me of Elijah when he went up before the king. And he says, I'm going to tell you that it is not going to rain another day until I say so. Okay? And it wasn't though Elijah was some kind of miracle worker. It wasn't as though as Elijah was some kind of spiritual meteorologist. But it was Elijah was able to go with boldness because he knew that in the Deuteronomy, Levitical law, he said, if you turn away from the Lord and you stop following after God, you know, not only will you have the curse, but I will not allow rain to fall on your land, okay, until you turn back unto the Lord. And that's what it was. He was calling God out, you know, because the Bible says the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. And that's what it was. It was the prayer of Elijah that says, God, you said. You said if they turned away uh, that you would uh, cease it from raining. And God says, Elijah, you're right. Okay, that's the boldness we're talking about. 
uh, just saying, God, I know that Christ is sitting at your right hand. I know that I can approach your throne. I know that you know my heart. I know that you know my burden. And I know that you are greater than any situation that this world could ever face. And Lord, I am coming to you humbly, but yet boldly with my request, my prayer, my plea, my sorrow, my grief, my anger, whatever it is. And you can approach him with boldness because of the fact that he is our high priest because of the fulfillment of prophecy, because of the consistency of God and his word, because of the substance of things hoped for, and that is our faith. Okay, And that should give you peace in your pursuit of righteousness. As the king of peace and the king of righteousness, Jesus brings peace to our troubled hearts and righteousness to our lives. Now remember, just like joy is not necessarily happiness, right? You can go through particular times in life and not necessarily be happy, but be content with joy. At the same time, you can have the peace that passes all understanding because I think sometimes we think that peace is the absolute uh, absence of any trouble or tribulation. No, peace is Jesus sleeping on the boat in the midst of a storm, okay? He's still peaceful. He's still full of joy. And we can have that as well. And we have that not through our own resolve, not through our spiritual fortitude, not through our own resilience. We have it through our intercession in Jesus Christ by laying it all upon him. See, again, as we've been learning when it comes to trials, when it comes to tribulations, so many times we we're, we're, we're think we're praying, Lord, just make it go away when God is using that to bring something out in us to draw us closer to him. We're missing out on the very thing that God is doing in our lives that is for our best. And that's not always the greatest feeling in the world, but at the same time, you can have that peace that passes all understanding. We are called to live in the peace he provides and to pursue righteousness in our daily walk with him. So let's finish with some questions here. How does Melchizedek foreshadow Christ? Okay, First, we see there's blessing and provision. Just as Melchizedek blessed Abraham, we saw that in Genesis. He gave him bread, and he gave him wine, and he provided that. That's a picture of how Christ blesses us, and he provided for our spiritual needs, offering his body and his blood on the cross. We celebrate that as we observe the Lord's Supper. We take the bread, and we take the juice as a picture of his body and his blood. This do in remembrance of who? Melchizedek? No, in remembrance of Jesus Christ. Okay, so we see that, uh, the blessing and provision, but also uh, we see the, uh, the, the recognition of authority. Abraham acknowledged Melchizedek's authority by giving him a tithe, and we recognize Christ's authority and honor him with our worship and our offerings as well. Uh, we see that Abram, Abraham was willing to do that. He understood who Melchizedek was, but we more so through Jesus Christ. Finally, we see there's priestly mediation. Melchizedek's role as priest who mediates between God and man points to Christ's ultimate role as our high priest, okay, who intercedes on our behalf. You know, there are intercessory prayers. The Holy Spirit helps us pray as we ought. But there are times where there's intercessions being made for us and we, we are not praying as we should. But to God be the glory that we have those opportunities. Number two, how does the priesthood of Christ affect the believer today, okay? How does, that, how does that affect me today? What does that mean? Well, we have confidence in our access to God. You know, some people uh, in, in, uh, in religion today uh, wonder if their prayers are being heard. They wonder and they hope that maybe, that maybe if I do everything right, if I, if I pray the right prayer, I say the right words, that it might just catch God's ear just right. That's not true. Some uh, will believe that perhaps if they're one of the chosen, uh, they're going to live a life and they live well enough and they live in this chosen state of being that they'll learn it at the end. That's a miserable existence. We don't have that. We have confidence in our access to God because of the priesthood of Christ. Knowing that his priesthood uh, is eternal gives us confidence that we have continual access to God through him. God is never too busy for you. God is never too busy for you. You're never overwhelming him. You're never bothered to him. He actually encourages us to come unto him. And this gives us security in our salvation. It assures us that our salvation is secure because Christ is perfect and Christ is unending. Okay? And then it also gives us encouragement in our prayer life. It encourages us to pray boldly, knowing that Jesus is always there, listening, waiting, calling, and, 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 and wanting to hear our prayers. 
So he does that. Uh, we learned it this past Sunday in the scripture reading with Bill. Ask, seek, knock, right? We need to ask. We need to seek. We need to knock. And with that, what significance does it have? How does Christ as priest and king affect us today? Okay. Uh, it shows his authority, his complete authority. It illustrates that Jesus holds the comprehensive authority, both ruling as king and mediating as high priest. And that should really resonate with us today as we see a world going haywire, as we see things just getting crazier and crazier every day, but we have the confidence and can rest assured that Christ has the authority over all. And we serve the King of kings and the Lord of lords. It shows the perfect atonement for sin. As priest, Jesus perfectly mediates between God and man, providing complete atonement for sin. What he has done is complete. We don't ever have to wonder, well, I know Jesus forgave me for my sins, but is there any more that I have to do? No, by grace are you saved through faith, not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. By faith, lest any man should boast. It is all complete and done at the cross. And then with that, we have divine governance, okay? As king, Jesus governs our lives. He brings peace and righteousness, ensuring his sovereign rule over all creation. When it seems like everything's going haywire, when it seems like everything's going crazy, just remember, Jesus understands and he knows all that's going on, especially what's happening next door, whatever that was. All right. <laughs> all right, finally, the last one, the believer's response to Christ as priest and king. This should compel us to do this because we have all the security, because we have all the consistency, all the continuity, all the substance, all the sustenance of everything within the scriptures because of Christ's completed work at the cross. It should compel us to be in a pursuit of holiness, striving to live righteous lives, okay? Reflecting Christ's character in our actions and in our decisions, okay? Uh, because he died for us, he gave all for us. He watches for us. We have every resource we need uh, through the scriptures. We have every resource we need through the one who owns the cattle on a thousand hills. We have everything we need through Christ, and that should cultivate peace within our lives. It should cultivate peace in resolving the issues of our life and helping us draw closer to him as we confess our sin, and he cleanses us from all our sin. And he does that each and every day. He did it eternally at the cross. But when we confess our day-to-day -day issues to him, we are forgiven and we are cleansed. And with that, we should have a continued trust, placing our trust in Christ and relying on his guidance and resting in his provision and resting in his protection. So again, as we look at that, as we look at Melchizedek, uh, understanding Melchizedek is a type of Christ that helps us in regards to our comprehension of Christ's eternal priesthood, his dual role as king and priest, um, it assures us of the completeness of our salvation and encourages us to live righteous lives. So with that, let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for, again, your son, Jesus Christ, and just the complexity of it all, but the simplicity of it as well.